Next of those is Alexandra Zimmerman, uh, who's from the Wild Crew, and in this context, more importantly, leads the IUCN Task Force on Conflict, and it's about that that she's going to tell us now. Alex. Thank you very much. Um, so we are talking in these three days about some of the key conservation issues um, that are global and that are largely very interdisciplinary and looking at these from many different angles. And human-wildlife conflict is exactly that. It is um, an issue that is absolutely global, as I'll show you, and, and that requires much more interdisciplinary collaborative working. So what do we mean by human-wildlife conflict? It is, in the simplest form, the situation you have when you have a, a species that is not a pest, that is of some conservation interest, that is directly affecting a people or a human community, and there is retaliation against that. Now, whether you want to call it human-wildlife conflict or something like conflict over wildlife is another whole discussion, but I'm using this term as it is um, very widely used around the world. And basically, human-wildlife conflict is at its core and at all different levels, whether locally or globally, all about people and parties negotiating over resources, over their over values, um, relationships, economic and political and even territorial interests. And it is really a global issue. So you have a great number of species affected by this conservation issue, certainly any of the large carnivores, we know that the nine largest felids, um, uh, for them, human wildlife conflict is a very real serious threat. Most of the large carnivores, many large primates, uh, crocodiles, even otters, also birds of prey, um, sharks, uh, many, many species, even fruit bats are affected by this, um, and of course, millions of people, and a huge diversity of people, people who are perhaps living um, in situations below poverty line, living uh, just off one small patch of uh, rice that they have, or people who might have 10,000 head of cattle and simply don't like the fact that there's a predator around who might take one or two. And this is the huge diversity of situations we deal with. And it isn't just a wildlife conservation issue, it definitely links into sustainable development goals because very often you are dealing with um, people who live in poverty, you have, um, it, it compromises many of these, the, the paths towards many of these sustainable development goals, of course, particularly 14 and 15. And so there are really four, uh, three very big challenges that make human wildlife conflict a urgent and difficult conservation issue. The first that it is that it is absolutely global. So just to give you a spatial impression, this map shows in gray, shades of gray, the livestock in South Asia and Southeast Asia. And the red is actually the tiger range outside of protected areas. And immediately you see a problem there, that kind of overlap. Similarly, on the other side of the world, jaguars range from northern Mexico to northern Argentina across 17 countries. This is the range. If you put onto that um, cattle densities, this is what it looks like. If you put over that protected areas and then calculate, you find that 64% of the Jaguar range is outside of protected areas. And this number isn't going to shift very much. So basically, for Jaguars, human wildlife conflict is an absolute priority uh, threat that we have to figure out how to resolve if we want this species to persist. And one of the reasons this, um, the fact that they're outside of protected areas is so important uh, to deal with is that not only are they outside, but the edges of protected areas are where a lot of the losses of, of these species happen. So just simplified, basically you have a protected area, say with jaguars or another carnivore in it, and you have a resource outside that's very attractive to that species and easy to, to take, and um, as a result, you get retaliation against the species, and you can have that uh, population go extinct locally more rapidly than, say, some bigger 
um, threat like habitat loss will decimate that population. And if you start having this happen in lots of different places across the range, you can understand what's, where the threat is to the species at range scale. The other issue, which we are not yet even so far in human wildlife conflict dealing with at all, is the fact that we are having some successes with conservation of some iconic species, such as tigers in Nepal, for example, and that is wonderful. Um, but we have to start to plan for this, because when you have a carnivore that is recovering, whether it's tigers here or, or wolves in Europe, these are emerging conflicts, and uh, it's very difficult to um, get the support from people if, if you know, for example, here in, in uh, Nepal, you have all these protected areas, and you see that this is a protect, Bardia protected um, national park in Chitwan, and then millions of people in between, but tigers are emerging there. So we must deal with this, otherwise human-wildlife conflict will just unravel the work of the species conservation. Climate change is even starting to, we were starting to realize that this is uh, exacerbating some human-wildlife conflicts. This is um, in Bolivia, where there have been drought after drought after drought, um, year on year, and people have started to change how they use the land. They have shifted from agriculture more to livestock, and as a result, pumas and bears are taking livestock and retaliation is happening. So human wildlife conflicts are constantly changing systems and they, are, they result out of some of the other conservation issues um, that, are also, that we're also dealing with. Now the second huge core challenge in human wildlife conflict is that there, every situation is extremely complex. Um, we're dealing here not just with the rational uh, conflict over a resource that a species is damaging, but there are so many different emotions um, and factors involved, um, everything from power to beliefs, politics, and so forth. And maybe I can describe this through a few examples. This is um, a giant armadillo. Um, they're about that size. They love to raid beehives. They like the larvae and the beehives. This is in Mato Grosso State in Brazil. And so the, the beekeepers have their beehives on, on these stilts. And the armadillos just go on their hind legs, knock the hive over, um, and raid the beehives. Now, very, you might see this and immediately think, well, there's a simple solution to this. All you need to do is raise that about so much, and the armadillo can't reach it. Problem solved. But it isn't really solvable that way because when you start to uncover what is really going on here, it turns out that this local human population has a very strong superstition against giant armadillo. They absolutely hate them. They feel that if an armadillo comes anywhere near your house, something very bad is going to happen to your family. So they don't want this practical solution because there are underlying cultural reasons for not tolerating these species. Um, Conversely, here's an example of relative coexistence. The Asiatic lion and the gear of India, the tolerance for this species is remarkably high. Um, the Malhari people who have livestock, who lose livestock to lions every now and then, um, are not largely retaliating against this species. And so really what we need to be asking here is, why is that? And how do we protect that cultural tolerance and, how, and what might threaten it? What kind of maybe land use or social change that we might anticipate could um, threaten that kind of coexistence? Sometimes uh, human wildlife conflicts get very messy when there's a lot of different parties involved. This is um, human bat conflict. So basically, fruit bats in Mauritius raid orchards, large, particularly lychees, but also mangoes. And at the level of an orchard, you, there's, there's things you can do. So you can, you can net a tree. It's quite laborious because, in fact, bats learn very quickly how to crawl under here, and then they just sit inside the net and feed uh, happily. Um, but there are practical solutions. But again, this is an issue of many different stakeholders involved who have different views on the matter, but also there are very complex power dynamics between these stakeholders. And I will talk a bit more about this later on. And then you have emerging conflicts 
like this. This is the, the uh, Kutupalong refugee camp of Rohingyas who have come from Myanmar to Bangladesh within the last year and a half. 800,000 people have settled in this area where there were few people before. And just off, sort of over here, there was an, a protected area with elephants in it. And these elephants used to walk across um, this landscape. And now there's 800,000 refugees in the way. And uh, 14 refugees have been killed by elephants that have wandered into, into the refugee camps. And this is where it gets even more complex because you're dealing with, with the, the issue of safety, protecting elephants, and a very delica delicate social crisis and a trans-border issue. So what makes, what makes um, human wildlife conflicts so complicated is that no two conflicts are ever alike. Some are simply about the resource. Sometimes you just have a situation of elephants raiding crops, people um, losing their, their income in one night, and after some time retaliating against that species. And if you deal with that, uh, the resource problem and you find a solution to that, you can pretty much uh, um, go a long way to resolving this conflict. But many conflicts are much more complicated than this. Some are about culture. Take, for example, jaggers in, in um, Brazil. They take cattle. Um, this, of course, upsets a farmer uh, who hunts the jagger in retaliation. And you might think that if you protect the cattle, better husbandry, better um, uh, fencing, that, that would, this would be broken, that would stop. But that's not the case because, in fact, in this particular community, there is a culture of hunting jaggers. And they'll just say, well, thank you very much for the fence and the veterinary uh, assistance. We will still hunt jaggers once you're not here. And some conflicts are even more complicated than this because they are actually about identities. And the classic example for this is wolves in Europe, Northern Europe especially, and, uh, and uh, in North America. And again, at the, at the surface level, it appears to be wolves taking sheep. But this is not about wolves and it's not about sheep. So this is about people from different backgrounds, different groups who perceive their identity to be, to be completely opposite or, or different from other people. So it is, I mean, this headline here, Wolf War, kind of describes what is actually going on here. So in human wildlife conflict, we're tr constantly trying to figure out how do we conceptualize these different layers and how do we work with them. And one model that we devised is to look at basically three layers of human wildlife conflict. The first is where you have a dispute. There's always some kind of loss that's going on. If you're just dealing with this, then a practical solution to um, those losses can, can go a ways to resolving the conflict. But very often, what happens is that you have your losses, but, and there have been attempts to resolve this, and those attempts have failed over and over again. And this creates a history of resentment um, and a history of conflict. And then just putting up a fence will no longer really take care of this issue because there is stuff going on underneath. And at the third and worst level, you have what we call deep-rooted conflict, where not only have you got lo the losses, you've got a built-up history of losses, but people are starting to feel like there is a division between the parties and there's, they might feel threatened in their identity or their values. Now, I hope you can see straight away from this that if you are dealing with this kind of human-wildlife conflict, simply putting up a barrier or a deterrent isn't going to help. Not only isn't it, is it not going to help, it's going to possibly make it worse because you might, um, because you're adding to the history if it's not working and you are um, actually possibly offending this delicate situation of different uh, identities. The third core challenge in human wildlife conflict is the fact that every single case is different from the next. And this is really a problem because if this is a global um, conservation issue, how are we going to scale this up and replicate successes rapidly as is, many of these are pretty urgent. 
So if we take a look at just jaggers, it's one species across Latin America. Um, a few years ago at Wild Career, we did a survey um, involving expert opinion, a review, and also um, a set of 17 case studies across seven different countries. We looked at lots of different things that might predict why some communities tolerate jaggers more than others. But unfortunately, we could not find any universal patterns. We found some patterns in certain, some, some predictors that replicated themselves maybe in three or four cases, but then not in 14 other cases. And it was completely all over the place and basically had to um, conclude that, first of all, as any social scientist will tell you, you must not generalize from case studies, but also that if we look too much at what works in one place and assume that this is transferable to another, um, we might be making a dangerous assumption. Um, one way to show this is this graph shows attitudes towards jaggers across 17 different places in Latin America. And you can see here, this one, the attitudes towards jaggers are very positive, largely. This is in the Pantanal of Brazil. And now the red shows the social norms of killing jaggers, whether or not it is acceptable in your community to kill jaggers. And interestingly, first of all, it's, it's striking that it's all over the place. But then also, if you look at the Pantanal again, you've got very positive, the most positive attitudes towards jaggers, but you've got very, very, um, uh, a lot of killing. It is absolutely acceptable in that community to kill jaggers. And so this is completely at odds with each other, whereas in other cases, these things are um, aligned in different ways. And so really what this is kind of a warning not, not to make assumptions from just for example, studying attitudes. There's so much more going on in every conflict and we have to look at these individually. And so really the question that we're grappling with is if every case is different and every case is hugely complex and it is a global issue, how on earth do we work at this grassroots level and at the global level to, at the same time? And how do we work with these different scales? So at the... Uh, local or the community scale, quite a bit of progress has been made. There's a lot of projects that work intensely with communities on human wildlife conflicts and have learned um, how to go about this and how to do it well. And it tends to boil down to the quality of the, the engagement with the community. Um, for example, elephant um, crop rating is a huge issue across 13 range states in Asia. And we found in a project um, in Assam, northeast India, where this was a huge problem. That, for example, if you build an electric fence, th these fences do work, they keep out elephants, but whether or not they are maintained by the community is, is the bottom line of whether they will um, be sustainable. So the, in this case, this was a community that had stopped growing any rice for four years. They had built platforms and trees to sleep in during certain parts of the year because they have, were constantly losing everything to elephants and even several people got killed. Um, and so with them we built, well actually they built, this electric fence. It's quite simple compared to some of the fences out there and it worked perfectly because what, ha what was the, the process um, that was followed here was to not only come in and, and build a fence for them but to let them make the decisions on how that would be done and, and how it would be maintained. And what you do by doing it that way is you transfer not just the, the physical fence, but the entire process, the ownership. You realign power and responsibility. And at the local level, what it boils down to um, is that you need to create value, the, uh, or you need to preserve or create value in the species as well as tangible economic benefit. Whenever you have these two together, there is huge potential for coexistence. If you have one or the other, it's a slightly more fragile um, uh, state. At the national regional scale, I want to give you a quick example from Mauritius where we have fruit bats that are raiding orchards. Um, and this is very complicated because there are many, many different parties in this conflict who are at odds with each other, and some of this is historical. Some of these, the, the heads of a couple of organizations are high school rivals, and because of that, you have 
um, people not willing to work together. And these are the layers and layers that you get in these human wildlife conflicts. So this has become a very um, high profile issue in Mauritius. And, and it appears, again, as all human wildlife conflicts appear at the outset, at the surface to be about a simple resource. When you dig into it and you ask, for example, what people would like the outcome to be for um, Mauritius fruit bats, very often when you ask a general population this question, you get a sort of a bell curve where most people say, not in my backyard, please, but not extinct and not more. And what we found in Mauritius is that if most people said they wanted the species extinct, which is very worrying. But then you have to dig into this and ask who is saying this? Is it everybody? And it turns out it's not everybody. It's not the orchard owners. The orchard owners said, I don't want the bats here, but they may persist. Um, but the general public hated bats. And so, again, uncovering these layers is absolutely critical because obviously you're going to adapt your strategy um, and your process once you realize this. Now, at the international scale, I come back to this um, example of the human elephant conflict in Myanmar, in, in Bangladesh, where we've had one million people um, in a very short period of time settling in this part of Bangladesh. There is this elephant population, about 40 elephants, which were traditionally moving across. And basically, IUCN and UNHCR are now trying to find solutions to this, which will be rooted in understanding the social conflicts and the geopolitical conflicts that are underlie this, this apparent um, elephant situation. Similarly, often human wildlife conflicts go across boundaries. This is Royal Manas National Park in Bhutan, Manas in India, and elephants obviously cross the border. So, and in Chitwan, tigers on both sides of India and Nepal. And this requires cooperation between countries. And so this is where these sort of human wildlife conflicts definitely become geopolitical and they require skills that are far beyond biology. These require things like diplomacy. Um, I'm just going to speed through something here. So basically, if we want to understand these conflicts, we want to gain insights about them, um, collaborate on working on them, all these things point to the, the conclusion that silo working, as Inger said yesterday, is going to get us absolutely nowhere with human wildlife conflicts, as with many other conservation challenges. Um, this is a conservation challenge that absolutely requires many, many different disciplines. I'm listing just a few here. It requires also conservation geopolitics, as we're beginning to define it here. And it definitely requires transdisciplinary conservation. So while human wildlife conflicts are global, they're, each case is unique, they're very complex, and the solutions are different in every place and every scenario, um, one thing that I think is true across the board for human wildlife conflicts is that the way forward is to, to figure out um, ways of working collaboratively across disciplines. Transdisciplinary conservation is the absolute way forward to, for resolving these, this challenge for um, conservation. And I will leave it there. Thank you very much.